Another installment of Moto America's 21 in 21. 21 Superbike champs since the inception of the class all the way back in 1976. And we've got to welcome number 19 in, Josh Heron. Hey, Josh Heron, how are you, man? I'm good, Greg. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Kind of a weird one because this is the first of the last three that I'm going to do of, of current racers. So, but let's, let's get into it, Josh. I mean, you, you storm on the scene in AMA, Superbike, and Supersport. Very first race, you win your first podium. And then what, by 2012, you're a rookie in Superbike and you win it in only your second year, 2013, in an eight race series with four wins. Let's talk about leading up to that, you know, that pivotal year and then your Superbike championship year. Yeah, it was, uh, man, I, I think everybody thinks the same way, but when I think of 2006, my, my rookie year, you know, to me, that was the good days, right? Like I, I just remember being a kid, 2006 was a unique year because I turned 21 or uh, sorry, I turned 16, which was an elbow riding age in AMA midway through the season. So we started out racing some weird stuff and it was, it was crazy because the guy to beat at the time was Robert Jensen and he was getting on AMA podium. So it was, super cool to me to be able to race with him, not only to race with him, but to be able to beat him was like a huge accomplishment for us. So I went into that year with this huge wave of confidence. And, uh, it was a year where me and my dad just did the racing ourselves, but Yamaha helped us out. Graves helped us out a lot. And, uh, we were able to get on the AMA podium. I think you said it was the first race, but it was actually the second race. It was at uh, Utah. Um, so we were, you know, getting support from Graves, but we were basically running out of our own trailer and doing our own stuff. My dad was my mechanic. I only had one mechanic. It was him. And, uh, yeah, second round we got on the podium and this is when I think there was at least 12 guys that in that class that had won like top tier national races. I mean, the guy that finished 10th was probably like Ben Attard or Damon Buckmaster. Like, I mean, I probably not 10th, but somewhere close to that area like it to me that was crazy like when I first started it was it was such a different scene than it is now and and I look back at it all the time and it feels like it was yesterday but I'm one of the oldest guys in the paddock now so it's, it's pretty crazy to think about um but from you know really from that point until I won the Superbike championship it was almost like a blur to me it was I, I remember a lot of it but it was it was also a lot of painful years of uh getting second in the 600 championship with the, battling with Danny Eslick and Martin Cardenas and, and a bunch of super fast guys. And, um, uh, I think I got second, like from 07 to 11, I think I got second three, four times. So it was, it was hard, but it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was, um, the R6 has always been such a great bike for me. I had so much fun racing it. Danny Eslick taught me so much about being aggressive. Um, that I'm, I've been able to use my whole career. You know, we, I think we were so mad at each other so many times, but we had so many great battles on the track. I know you remember the the famous, you know, Barber 2010, I think when my dad, my dad cussed him out after he took me out and we we were, uh, he was doing a live interview on speed channel and he said something back to my dad really bad. And you were like, uh, yeah, we're live. Danny. <laughs> so it's <laughs> yeah. just, it's just a lot of, you know, moments that, right in the moment it felt I was so angry but when I look back on it it was it was so good for me to to really get beat up like that it was uh made me stronger and and I had so much fun you know in the races uh one of my my favorite things to do back then was just sit in second and follow all the time and it's funny because everybody used to get so they were so negative about that riding style. I'd sit in second for almost the whole race. And then the very last corner of the last lap, I would just pounce and win the race. And, you know, some people thought it was a bad way to race, but now that's what they kind of want me to do. <laughs> so it's weird how stuff has changed so much. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, those, those years were great. I was factory Yamaha, basically Graves Yamaha and R6, but that was the factory Yamaha team for 600s yeah. uh, from 2007 to 2011 and then ended up going to the official factory Yamaha team in 2012 on the super bikes. And I think I was, Ooh, how old was I? 21, I think. And, um, 
it was it was pretty crazy going from a bike that at the time we had very limited data on it was basically just mapping and chuck could look at stuff but we weren't you know adjusting a whole ton of stuff and uh we just it's i just remember the jump being so big you know going from a bike that weighed that much more i went you know i think i went into that super bike year in 2012 uh, when we started testing it like probably 135 pounds or something. And by the time we started, I was like up between 145, and 150 pounds, just because riding that thing took so much effort. You know, it wasn't that I was going to the gym, I was riding bicycles a lot, but it was just riding that huge bike with that much power was a lot harder. So I remember gaining a lot of weight. And uh, yeah, that, that year was cool. Cause I won 2012, I won rookie of the year. And that was to me a really cool accomplishment. Um, I can't remember who the other rookie was. Was Martin Cardenas a rookie in that year? He definitely could have been, yeah. The year there that- was somebody that was actually like a good rider because I remember thinking like rookie of the year, that's not that Yeah, it wasn't cool someone like this. me who never raced and was sitting off the back. <laughs> it was, yeah, someone good. I know you finished fourth in the championship that year as well. Just a couple yeah, points and I missed- out of the podium spot for the final, yeah. I should have had third that year, mm-hmm. I think right ahead of Roger, but I, I missed Nola. It was the one and only year we raced at New Orleans, and I missed it because I had broken my collarbone riding flat track or something. <laughs> and that was pretty disappointing. I I really wanted to get top three in the championship that year, but it was uh, you know, it was it was cool either way just to to wrap that up and and then but also uh, Josh, yeah. you come in in the middle of a run, you know, by Josh Hayes, and the reality yeah. is, is no matter what you say, and this is going to be an interesting conversation talking about the year you won the championship is that you you did dethrone the king at the time and yeah that's the reality it was, um, of it when you look at the final results at the end of the day you won the national championship but tell us about 13 and and your view of what 2013 was like um i remember being the start of the year was super good but super bad because we we won i think the first race so daytona was round 1 uh won the first race Hayes had a mechanical Cardenas finished second and I think Blake Young was there that year also um and then the second race of the weekend I I just remember the first race I got arm pumped really bad but I was able to like barely hold on to the end Cardenas caught like four seconds or something and and almost got me race two I think Hayes had like another clutch issue or something so he DNF the first two rounds yeah, I and that. I was leading the race and got arm pump really bad again, but it was way worse than the first day. Cardenas caught me, past me, so it was like a super good way to start the week, the year. But I had to go right away to Doctor Brian and get arm pump surgery. That was the first time I'd ever had it, and uh, so I was really nervous for the second round. Um, but I was able to bounce back pretty well, and that whole year was a lot of weird mistakes from Josh Hayes, a lot of weird jump starts. Uh, I think, you know, at Daytona, he had the two mechanicals and then there was like the most jump starts I've ever seen in my life, which was really strange. But part of that was I the think rules, there was, wasn't it though? It was the rules of the like time if you too move, that kind of created. Yeah. Yeah. It was weird. Yeah, and some, some, I don't even know what the technical rule is right now with Moto America, but jump starts to me have always been so lame because it should just be like a three second penalty or something. Or I guess back then it was just a time penalty. It was like three seconds because I remember winning at mid Ohio and, or I came in second, like technically crossed the line in second, but there was a time penalty on Hayes. So I won the race, but I was mm. in the middle of a live interview on CBS with Daniel Teal or something. And she said, uh, she's like, what do you think? Uh, you won the race. It's like, what do you, what's going through your mind right now? And I'm like, wait, what? I won the race. What are you talking about? I had like gotten all the way to the podium, done the qual flap, got to the podium, talked to my crew for a second, got to the interview and nobody had told me I won the race because it was such a weird feeling that year when Hayes would get those penalties and the whole Yamaha crew. I, I just remember that. It was like, that's part of the reason why I felt like I didn't deserve a lot of the stuff that I got that year, the wins, the championship was because the feeling in the Yamaha crew is really weird. Like, because they were pissed off about what was going on, I think, with Hayes. But then at the same time, you got to think, well, you got a Yamaha guy that's still going to win the championship if if 
something happens to him, right? Because we were battling. And I had some close races with him that year, but I, I struggled a lot at the end of the races that year, I remember. And I would have some really strong fights at the beginning with him. But man, he was so fast on that bike. You know, that was the pre-2015 model bike. So it was the dual exhaust under the tailpiece R1. And he, he'll he say it. He, he loved that thing. He liked it more than the newer model. And, uh, but I just remember that whole year was so hard because I, I wanted to just get a legit win and I don't feel like I, I ever really got it. And it was, uh, it's hard. I've always been hard on myself like that, but I also feel like that's part of it. Like mentally you need to get those real wins in order to have the confidence to keep going strong. And, uh, it just so happened that a lot of those wins that year were, were because he made mistakes, which you can also boil down to, okay, maybe he was nervous or maybe he was focused too much on getting the whole shot. So he didn't have to deal with me at the beginning of the race, but you know, as a racer, you always want that, that win. So it's, it was, it was a tough year, but at the end of the year, like you said, won the championship and it was, uh, one of the best, best, uh, accomplishments in my life. And, uh, it'll always be in, in history books. And it's, uh, something like, like you were talking about before the start of the show that only five people other than me have done in the last 20 years. So it's, it's incredible. It's, um, it really cool feeling. And, yeah. And the fact that you're still crazy racing to me. now, you know, yeah. the fact <laughs> you're still racing now and, and Josh, I mean, you know, just, just to give us broad strokes, I mean, you have been, you know, up and down in motorcycle racing and teams, and you've been able to revive yourself. And in 2018, it was the campaign to make Josh Heron factory again, <laughs> and you got it. Like, like what has racing been like for you since you won this championship? There's, there's been so many times I, I can, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Tin Cup. Yeah. So I, I think of myself as that guy in that, in that, uh, golf tournament he was in the u.s open and he had the chance to to win the match or to win the u.s open and all he had to do <laughs> to win the u.s open was lay it up before the pond and then chip it over the pond and put it in for par and he would have won the u.s open and his caddy and everybody around him was telling him just lay it up but he's always been known as this guy that wanted to just go for it and he said no screw you give me the, give me the three wood and he, he tried to make it over and he, he missed and then he still had a big enough lead that he could have taken that stroke, dropped it on the other side of the pond, and still won the U.S. Open. But he said, no, give me the three-wood, and he tried to hit it over again and missed. And and it, uh, he ended up taking 12 strokes on that final hole, which I don't know if it's a true story. I know it's based off of a true story, but 12 strokes on the final hole of the U.S. Open. And whenever he got back, though, you know, the last, the last stroke or the second to last stroke, he made it. Oh, no, it was because he got it right into the hole that last hit the crowd just went wild and they didn't give a shit about who won the u.s open that year they cared about this guy because he put on a show and i was like watching this movie and i'm like ah, has this been me my whole life like if, if i just been this guy that wants to just be putting on a show for everybody so bad that i've missed opportunities to to do better in racing and i I think sometimes I have been, and you know, most of the time I haven't been like on my mind all the time. I want to win, but there's been those times where people are like, why are you passing so early in the race like that? Or why are you doing this? I'm like, man, it just fuels my fire. Like something about that, you know, moment when the crowd, you can actually hear the crowd, you know, over the motorcycles at the races because you make a cool pass and turn 10 a and B at road Atlanta or something. It's, there's nothing more exciting and anything that gets your adrenaline going that much when you can hear that. And, and I've always just loved being that guy. It, it wasn't an attention thing. It's just, I want to be somebody that's remembered for something awesome. Not, Oh, you won a championship. Like that's awesome. But only the diehards remember that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, the people that come to the races for the first time don't have a clue who you are, but when you can make an impact on them to make them come back to another race the next year, that's, you know, that's where the real money's made or the real fans are made because those people will be diehards for you for the rest of their life and then their kid's life where, you know, I'd say 30% of the people that go to the races are the ones who think about the guy who won the last race, especially when you have years like this year where we're all just getting our asses kicked by Kanye, right? They want they want a, a different show other than, than who's winning the races all the time. But um, Well, the other thing too, so yeah. Josh, is like when you look back on your career, don't you think that you can say that you were authentic to yourself, that you didn't, you know, that you did it 
because of your passion and the way you wanted to do it. And at the end of the day, when you're sitting alone with yourself or with your family, that that's more important than saying I did what other people wanted me to do. Yeah, I think so for sure. You know, that's part of the, it's the same thing with saving money. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> why are you saving all this money your whole life? You're going to die and you could die next year. And then there was nothing to show for it because all you did was work so hard to make the money. You never enjoyed it. Yeah. So I had this factory super bike ride my entire childhood. Like I'm 31 years old now and I'm still on a factory team racing <laughs> arguably hundred to 150 thousand dollar motorcycles and getting paid to do it and I am lucky enough that I walk into like a Lowe's and somebody says hey Josh like, I'm like hmm. whoa like that's the coolest feeling ever like I watched the guy last night he just I'm big into collecting baseball cards and somebody recognized him in a Target he's like that's got to be the coolest thing I've ever happened to me is somebody recognized me just in a grocery store and to me it is like I and like you said I all those years racing for factory teams, you know, I, I'm not saying I could have won more championships because, you know, anybody could say that. But if I look back and I said, you know, I'm 60 years old, and I'm talking to my family and they're, they're going to be bored when I say I won all these races. But if I can remember these stories and uh, <laughs> the time I almost show got them fight with Danny tapes, Eslick stories. <laughs> yeah, it's man, it's it's awesome. Yeah, and, it makes total uh, sense. I mean, it does make total sense. So where do we find you in life now? I mean, we know you're racing currently, but what does life have in store for Josh Heron in the immediate future? Uh, it's to me, I've, my whole life has changed in the last three years. I, I met Rachel, who's now my wife. Uh, as soon as we got married, you know, two months later, we, we were pregnant, which we didn't find out until five months later, but, um, <laughs> okay. you know, I don't know when this video is coming out, but as I'm talking right now, we're. Rachel's literally doing this on the yoga ball every day, just trying to get the baby to come out before we go to the New Jersey race, because <laughs> no matter what, I'm not, I'm not missing the last two rounds, but we want to, we want to get, get the baby out before I leave, obviously, because I don't want to have a situation where I'm at the race and my baby's born because that would be just, just be a bummer. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. um, so that's right now. The main focus is me getting back from having, having COVID. I had COVID not too long ago and it's taken a lot out of me worse than an, anybody I've talked to that's had it and trying to get everything ready for the baby. So we've been just setting up baby room and, and getting everything ready for baby and, and, uh, just, just having fun. It's a, it's a whole new chapter in my life that a lot of people have told me about, but I just was like, how could it change you that much? And baby's not even here yet. And, uh, I have so much more respect for, for Rachel and, and, uh, for my mom and Rachel's mom and all the moms out there. Um, because really, you know, no matter how much support we try to try to give our wives during pregnancy it's it's you know it's nothing we can't we can't help <laughs> they're just you know sitting there in pain and and uh i feel helpless because i can't i can't really do anything besides massage her or get her some food or something so it's it's been a, a crazy feeling and now that he's literally any day away you know from being here it's it's nuts um last night we uh Literally, when I say any day, like the doctor said four days ago, she thought he would come the next day. So last night we went to a Dodgers game. It was Dodgers versus, versus Braves. I tra trained with Freddie Freeman, who's the MVP um, of the league last year. And and uh, so we went to go to a Dodgers game, which I've been a lifelong Dodgers fan. But Freddie Freeman plays for the Braves, and we got tickets from Freddie Freeman. And, and I told Rachel, I was like, the doctor said we shouldn't go. You know, it's an hour away from where we live. I was like, we got to go. Like this is Dodgers versus Braves. Freeman gave us tickets. Like we got to go. She's like, yeah, you're right. We got to go. So we went last night and I was like, man, kind of a cool story. If, if Griffin was born, you know, during Dodgers game, <laughs> like, it'd be kind of neat. So uh, luckily we no, nothing happened where she was fine and, and we made it back home. But that's the excitement in our lives right now is, is, uh, you know, just baby coming and, and uh, getting to experience cool things. We started a tradition last night, you know, it's his first Dodger game. Uh, you know, I consider it. he's not born yet, but he's moving around and belly knows what's going on. So we're going to buy a baseball at each game and, and write down, you know, what the, what the score was and what the date was. So he, he has a wall of balls by the time he's, you know, 10, 15 years old. So it's just, just uh cool stuff like that. That's just cheering you up so much. Like this year has been hard, but uh, having, all this going on right now uh, and it's so much more real than it was a couple months ago um it's it's just exciting and makes me pumped to go and race and, and just try and get a win and and uh 
bring home some trophies for the baby's room. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Well, listen, congratulations again on your 2013 championship. Thanks for doing this interview. And Josh, you know, I think that, you know, in looking at your career, there's a couple key phrases that people always say about you, that you're one of the most talented racers to ever climb on a motorcycle and that you always gave it over a hundred percent, especially when racing. And you definitely did entertain the fans. So here is to congratulations on the baby, hopefully early, you know, being born and many years to come of you in the saddle of a motorcycle, entertaining Moto America fans. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for uh, giving me a lifelong, uh, you know, set of DVDs at my grandma's house to get excited about watching when I hear you announcing, because you've been there since, since I was 16 and you're still there. So I think out of anybody, you're the guy that I've seen the most in the paddock over the last 15 years. So it's been a, it's been a really, really fun trip and hopefully we can, you know, go another five, 10 years. So thank you. Thanks, Josh. See (laughs) you. Thanks.